ICQ Podcast episode 315. Is it worth building a small contest DX station? Well, Happy New Year to you, fellow Amateur Radio Enthusiasts, and welcome to this, our first episode of 2020 of the New Decade, episode 315 of the ICQ Amateur Radio podcast, supported as always by our monthly and annual subscription donors. In this episode, Martin M1MRB is joined by Ruth, Kilo Mike 4, Lima Alpha Oscar, Edmund, Mike Zero, Mike November Golf. And Leslie, Golf Zero, Charlie, India, Bravo, to discuss latest Amazon Radio news. Myself, Colin, M6BRY, rounds up the news in brief. And this episode's feature is a feature on Is It Worth Building a Small Contest DX Station? Well, as always, we'd like to thank our uh, subscription donors for keeping us advert free and providing us a base to, uh, I say, pay our way. It's always greatly appreciated, those uh, small donations coming every single month. Make uh, this decade the decade where you show your support too. And all you need to do is visit uh, icqpodcast.com forward slash donate where so you can show your value for the show and your enjoyment for keeping the show advert free uh, by setting up a subscription donation or a uh, one-off donation to uh, help us along our way. Well, now we uh, join uh, Martin, Ruth, Edmund and Leslie to discuss the latest amateur ham radio news, including Dare to Imagine the Future of Ham Radio and Rescue in Remote New Zealand Park. As always, guys, hope you enjoy. The ICQ Podcast. Come for a moment. Stay for an hour. Well, hi, guys, and welcome to episode 315 of the ICQ News Roundtable. Tonight, uh, we have with us Mr. Leslie Butterfield, G0CIB. Good evening, Martin, and I've recovered from our New Year's hangover, so I'm bright and breezy for this show. Yep, yeah, well, that's good news, good news, and it's the first one of 2020, isn't it? And, yes, uh, in, yes, indeed, yes, indeed. Yeah, so uh, a brand new year, let's see what we can do on the podcast. I also have Mr. Edmund Spicer, M0MMJG. Hi, Edmund. Hello, Martin, and a very happy new year to you all. Yeah, happy new year to you, mate. And from the other side of the pond, where we're going to get her for a bit longer than normal... Because college isn't going to interfere today, we have Ruth Willett, KM4LAO. Hi, Ruth. Hello, everyone. It is great to be on. Yeah. Um, yes, I am enjoying my Christmas break, and I'll be here as long as possible. So, great to be on today. Looking forward to everything. Yeah, it's good to have you, Ruth. And uh, as I say, great that uh, you're not time restrained this time. So, uh, it, it's a good one to have. Now, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Dan Romacek, KB6NU, was unable to make it today. He's uh, had to do something with his wife this morning, which was important. Nothing too major, I believe, but Dan will be back with us in the next one. So, uh, looking forward to having you with us, Dan, on the next one. And also, uh, Mr. Matthew Nissa, M0NJX. Uh, Matthew, um, unfortunately has been tied up with work. Uh, he got uh, jumped with an extra job tonight on his way home and uh, has not been able to make it. So, uh, hey, once again, they'll be with us on another episode. Let's start the news stories with the ARRL dares us to imagine. And uh, the ARRL CEO, Howard uh, Mickle, WB2ITX, uh, challenges amateurs to imagine what it's going to be like in 2025. Well, it ain't that far away. Who's got the best crystal ball, Leslie? Is it you? No, I'm not Mystic Meg. I haven't got 2020 vision. Gosh, joking the aside, I mean, who knows where it's going to go. I mean, I'd, I'd like amateur radio to continue. Would the technology, or is the technology going to change? Certainly. We just have to go go with it and, and try and sort of, okay, where's it going to go next and what do we do about it? And can we get, or importantly, can we get more people in? But I know that's a bit of a topic for later on. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's interesting. And I think I think it's a difficult one. You know, if I, if I look back at, say, 2000 and said, where are we going to be? Probably wouldn't have got it right. But I don't think there's any right or wrong way. I think this is just for imagination. What do you think, Ruth? I think it's a really interesting topic, and the, the, the initiative that AWRL is working on is definitely sounds very interesting. Like, personally, I really still enjoy traditional clubs. I love interacting with and learning from 
all kinds of people from different walks of life and different interests in the hobby, not only the sections of ham radio that I've personally done. However, I mean, I certainly know that I've gotten lucky in terms of the clubs that I'm involved in. I've found some really, really, really great groups. And I know that there aren't as many excellent clubs like worldwide that everywhere. Um, so I really think that this idea of the verticals is also a, a really good idea. And I'm very, very curious to see where it goes from here. In addition, reading it, I was very intrigued by their wanting to do digital versions of National Contest Journal and QEX and some other mini magazines. It definitely sounds interesting and exciting and hopefully would get some more people interested. So I think that them working to provide the support for the special topic groups and whatnot is a really good initiative. And I'm really glad that the AWL is working on this. So I'm looking forward to following the story and seeing what happens through the board meetings and whatnot and seeing what results. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's, it's good. And I think it's, it's, down, it's much down to the individuals as the societies to shape our hobby because it is our hobby. Edmund, do you have any ideas where this might go? I've always been very bad at predicting what's going to happen, whether it's amateur radio-wise or in any other walk of life and i would even go as far as saying that whatever prediction i make is the thing that is likely not to happen um rather than the other way around i think we'll always need traditional clubs simply because you get people with differing interests within the hobby who will all be together in the same place at the same time and sometimes inspiration or information will come from the most unexpected of places uh, for example exactly a year ago 2019 we ran uh, my local club ran a one-off special event station that was really successful but the idea to do it in the first place came from a club member who to the best of my knowledge had never had any involvement with special event stations at all uh, or at least not not since 1980 something, and um, the guy who suggested it is a diehard contester, and contesting holds no interest for me at all. And yet he was the one, rather than the usual su suspects with regards to special event stations, who mooted the idea and then did probably 95% of the legwork in arranging it and organizing things and motivating people and basically making it happen uh which you could have knocked me down with a feather before i walked into that that meeting where he brought up the idea because you know he's a contester and so if we're all in our little vertical silos not sort of talking to each other in separate clubs at separate times then things like that might not come forth so um, I think we'll still need traditional clubs or maybe something like Essex Ham as a kind of umbrella group for lots of little specialised clubs within with disparate interests. Yeah, can I put my uh, oar in on this one, Martin? Um, I think Essex Ham do an absolute marvellous job and they, they really should be congratulated on what they do. One of the things, one of the problems we, we're crop finding, um, especially in England here, is that... Um, most of our radio clubs are, are running sort of like community centres, uh, some are in football clubs, and the owners of the club are becoming more commercially aware um, and putting their fees up so that the clubs can rent. And so, yeah, it's becoming, it's becoming uh, more financially difficult for some radio clubs. Yes, and what you've got is you've got some springing up on the internet, which is very, I mean, I've noticed a rise in that over the last couple of years. Lots of specialist groups with, with low overheads because they're on the, uh, on the, on the internet. Any thoughts on that, Martin? Yeah, well, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I know Pete uh, from Essex Hams. I know Dorothy and Richard, aka Mr. Dorothy. <laughs> uh, no, Richard, sorry for that. It's an in joke. Uh, but, the guys at Essex Hams do a great job. Suffolk Red. Um, I've talked about the Long Island uh, CW Club over in uh, the States and many, many more. And I'm, I've got to say, I'm going to forget somebody. And if I forgot somebody, I apologize. There are lots of people out there that are trying to 
make the best of our hobby and to grow our hobby. And it's not just one area or another. I think the clubs will change over the next few years. Uh, it's inevitable. You know, life's changing. If we look at technology as well, well, I wouldn't be a rocket scientist if I said we're going to see more uh, software-defined radios. But I think computers are going to be a, a more of an integral part of our shack going forward because with software-defined radios, a lot of the uh, new digital modes, uh, all sorts of bits and pieces, they will improve our enjoyment with the hobby. And as microprocessors get faster, the the digital stuff will get better. I mean, you can stand, if you stand with next to somebody who's got a, a digital radio and you call them, there is a time delay between you hear your voice and then you hear a few, uh, half a second or so later or whatever come out the radio next to you. Now, if the person's down the road, it doesn't matter because you you don't have that problem. But as microprocessors get faster, that time delay is going to reduce down so that it's going to pretty much, uh, you'll have digital quality at analog speed. Uh, things like that, I think we're going through a situation where people want to get out in the field, parks on the air, soda, and all those things are very, very good. The downside of that is we're now going into more of a society where people will want to sue you for just about anything. And uh, everybody thinks that their, their plot of land or whatever is worth an absolute fortune if you try and do anything on it. So I think it's going to be an interesting one. Apart from the clubs, guys, what do you think about the technology going forward? Well, if, if I said, Martin, uh, when I started in the hobby which was early 1980s, if I said to you that everybody, every man, woman and child would be walking around with a communications device that you could access anything, any information and at a power of computers that you would not believe and it'd be, be able to put, put it in your top pocket, you would not have believed me. But that's exactly what has occurred. Certainly has. And, you know, they aren't phones, they're mobile computers with a phone app. And, you know, we're seeing this with uh, SDR radio now. Um, you know, phenomenal. I mean, if you look at some of the SDR radios, I mean, I've got an SDR Play, one of the early ones. I'm very, very happy with it. Cost me about £100. All right, with a computer, it's it does the work of a receiver that would probably cost me three grand ten years ago to do what this does. So I think we're in a very exciting time. I think there will be some other killer that come um, thing that comes along. Um, I think at the moment people are pushing the boundaries with software and transmission modes. But, uh, you know, you start to look and think, well, is there any think new in antennas that's going to come out because that you've got to kind of obey the laws of physics but if you went back 30 years ago you'd have probably thought that the superhead receiver was never gonna gonna ever be replaced what's your thoughts on this one Ruth? i agree it's definitely very interesting to think about what could be coming in the next five years i mean just for me since i've been licensed it's amazing how much has improved how much has changed like just for me we just got a icom 7300 last year actually for my mom for christmas and i finally had the chance to use it this year and it's so much better than in some ways than the old other radios i've had so it's just fascinating to see how technology changes i don't really know off the top of my head any particular ideas of what could change but i know that there's plenty of people thinking about that and I'm very curious to see what gets released in the next couple of years. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Now, I, I, I'm showing my ignorance here, Ruth, because I didn't realize your mum was an amateur. Yes, she sure is. Um, my mom is sharing a KM4 TVU. Um, she actually got licensed after I did. Uh, once I got into the hobby, um, she realized how much fun I was having and decided that she'd get her license too. So... We took the test together on Mother's Day 2016. 
Um, the day that she passed her technician level license was actually the same day that I passed my extra level license. So we've had a lot of fun in the hobby. She's upgraded all the way up to amateur, amateur extra now. She loves it, and we love doing stuff together in amateur radio whenever we can. Well, that's that's actually brilliant, and and that's that's certainly one of the things that is very very good about our hobby, and, and I think should be promoted is that um, parent and sibling. I know when Colin and I first set this podcast up, Colin said, "Do I call you dad or do I call you mine?" And I said, "We've well, always called me dad, son." And a lot of people, a lot of guys, look forward to their sons coming on board. And there's no reason why your mum is probably very, very proud and wanting to be involved with you, it, it, because you're involved. So I'm, I'm tell you, mum, I'm looking forward to meeting her because I hopefully she'll be at Dayton this year. Yes, she will. She normally comes up. It's our midpoint of the school term meetup at Dayton. So I'll look forward to in- introducing her to you all. That'll be great. So Edmund, what's your thoughts on the technology going forward? Oh, I'm looking forward to the post digital age. But what that means and what it'll look like and when it'll arrive and how it works, I've no idea. Um, Going back to Essex Ham, taking Essex as an extreme example, you've got the Essex CW Club, you've got the Essex Repeater Group, you've got the Essex DX Group that specialises in QRP Moon Bounce on 70 Sems and other weird and wonderful stuff. And you've got a number of traditional clubs dotted around the county. So going vertical, uh, as, uh, as the phrase used, is all right, but uh, possibly don't take the silo mentality too far. Otherwise, specialist clubs with disparate interests might never meet up and talk to each other. That's the, the thing that worries me slightly, Martin. Yeah, well, we're a communications hobby. We should be communicating. And... If we do should it should right. be should be yes yeah I appreciate should be and I think a lot of people got very very worried and want to protect their own silo from a, what they believe is an attack and it's not an attack it's an amalgamation it's a work together it's assist each other it's a move forward because if we don't work together our hobby will shrink. It and we're going backwards. And we're going backwards. So Agreed good. completely. you got to work together to ha- move forward. You learn stuff from so many different people that you'd never imagine. It's definitely, communication is huge. And like I kind of said, that's, that's why I love the hobby so much. I get to interact with someone that I'd never interact with otherwise because they're an amateur radio operator. And it makes me interested and want to do other verticals in the hobby, if we're keeping that terminology. It makes me want to go do more digital modes. It's gotten me into fox hunting. It's wants me, I want to do EME. It's made me interested in other aspects because I and people around me have encouraged me to interact with other people in the hobby. Yeah, well, that's good. And unfortunately, Ruth, I apologize. We introduced you to Leslie, who's probably given you some new terminology. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> do you, Ruth, do you realise we actually ban fox hunting in this country? Ah, yeah. <laughs> 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 that's fox <hunting>, yes. <laughs> uh, he's talking about real fox hunting and not radio uh, or as good as such. No worries, I don't go hunting real foxes either. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> so all in all, ah, uh, there was one other group I did miss, and I apologise, boys, because you are on my radar a lot of the time. And that is um, Cam Hams. Cam Hams do a lot of good in the UK and a lot of support, uh, which is uh, very, very good. Moving on to our next news story. Radio amateurs are aid in a rescue in remote New Zealand park. Now, this happened uh, a little while ago. But once again, we have the technology. What do you think, Edmund? Yes, well, amateur radio works everywhere and anywhere, doesn't it? You're not reliant on a a signal from your local mobile phone operator. And uh, I, I read a while back that despite the claims that various mobile phone companies in the UK have made in years gone by about them covering 95 or 98 or 99% of the UK, 
when they come out with statistics like that, what they're talking about is the population rather than the geography. So even today in this brave new world of 2020, there are still places in the UK, and some of them not very far from where I'm talking to you now, actually, uh, where you will just not get a mobile signal out on any network. Um, I've walked along coastal paths many years ago down in uh, the Devon and Somerset and uh, Cornwall areas where there was just no mobile phone coverage at all. And if you needed to summon help, then doing it by radio or amateur radio would be the only way that have worked. So I'm not entirely surprised to read this, and I'm glad that Hams were able to, to step in and assist. Always take your hand out with your folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, if you're a shortwave listener, if you're a shortwave listener and you're not licensed for amateur, certainly in the UK, uh, PMR446, which is licensed three, half a watt, or in the States, the family radio service radios, take something, at least take something. They don't cost very much. You stick them in your bag and it's an extra bit of uh, help, isn't it? Uh, what's your thoughts, Ruth? I think that this is such a great story to have in our first podcast for 2020. I mean, I always love the rescue stories. I love seeing the amateur radio put to use in real life. Personally, I, you know, I hear a little more about amateur radio rescues from hams in the United States, but I don't hear as much about them worldwide. So it, I, mean, I was very happy to read this and hear about it. I'm just glad our hobby can be of such use and very glad that the injured man got out safely and got the help he needed. Yeah. Well, as I say, a lot of the time uh, we only hear about our own operations. So you would hear about the States, we'd hear about the UK. But the hobby's, you know, massive. We have a massive uh, coverage base. So I try and pick out interesting stories and show that it's not just from one part of the world. But you're right. It is nice to hear these. Leslie, your thoughts? I think it's a good, it's a, a good news story. We, these stories come up every now and again, and it just shows how valuable uh, amateur radio can be. Yeah, certainly does. And uh, as I say, I, I was at one point in time a member of Raynet, and if they needed me, I would uh, turn out and help them without uh, a second thought. However... In the nicest possible way, I am so tied up at the moment with many things I do that um, I couldn't commit the time for their exercises. However, once again, if they ever needed me, I'd make myself available in an emergency situation. So, And I think all amateurs would, so that's the good thing. Moving down the list, this is an interesting discussion point. I spoke to Ian... G3ZHI um, some time ago and he, he ran this by me and I said put it down on paper and it's taken a while but I don't 100% think that we should focus all of our activities in one area but Ian said we should be encouraging seniors to join amateur radio uh, I believe we also should be encouraging youth middle aged people and seniors but Ian writes and he's got some very valid points here in the UK, it says we have 11 million seniors. 4 million of them live on their own. 1 million say that they uh, they feel lonely. 20% of them say that they don't see their family weekly or friends or even neighbours. That's uh, quite a, 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 a population out there that probably could do with some social interaction. Leslie, I'm going to let you go first on this one because uh, you've had some experience on some of this, haven't you? Yes, I have. Right. I, th I think he's making some good points. Do I agree with everything he says? I've got to be honest, no. I think we should be encouraging everybody across the board. However, I do realise that as people are going through stages in life, you know, youngsters are taking their exams, therefore are tight on their time. As they grow up, some get married and they have a career, um, and then, you know, 40, the 40s, 50s tend to have more, more, more money because they've paid their mortgage off. So do I, do I think he has a point? Yes, but again, I, I don't agree with everything. I think we should, 
the, the problem is if we say, right, okay, we're just going to concentrate on the seniors, what happens is they, now some I know are very, very good. Um, um, we've both worked with people. And you know, I've worked with one guy that was in his 90s that were excellent. Um, but as we get older, we tend to get a bit fixed in our ideas. And you need people younger that, to challenge us and say, well, why are we doing this? Let's, let's have a go at this. And when you're younger, there's no fear of making mistakes. You know, you can have a go at something, and if it doesn't work, doesn't matter. You go, okay, next. And we sort of grow out of that. You know, we, we tend to sort of go for the safe option. So does he have a point? Yeah, like I said, that, that's, my, that's my take on it. Yeah, well, I think you're very fair on it. Listen, there's room in our hobby for seniors, middle-aged people, yes. young people, disabled people, guys of ethnic minorities. It doesn't matter. You're yes, all welcome. absolutely. Yeah, in my books, but that's me personally. So, uh, Edmund, what's your thoughts? Well... I've got to be a bit careful what I say here because I, uh, I'm in my early 40s, so uh, I hope I'm not classed as a, a senior just yet. Um, the only two people who I ever knew really, really well who could be described as seniors were my my dad and my grandma, my, my dad's mum. Me, mum and my dad were all only children, so I come from a very small family, you see. So. I'm pretty sure if they were here, and I, I appreciate that they don't represent seniors in general, that this is only sort of individuals who I knew personally. If I mooted the idea of them, uh, to them, of becoming involved with amateur radio, the instant reaction I would have got from the pair of them was, oh, I couldn't possibly do that. Oh, no, it's too complicated. I won't understand it. I've made up my mind that I won't understand it. If my if they were alive today and I suggested to either of them, and uh, I seem to remember both of them using the phrase, the saying, you can't teach old dogs new tricks um, several times in their lives. So <clears throat> once we got past that, the next reaction would then probably have been, well, if I really have to learn something that's completely alien to me from scratch, then wouldn't I do better to master the internet and social media where the world and its wife is online all the time rather than learning about amateur radio that's only done by a few people? So whilst the way Ian presents this, it looks really simple, doesn't it? Um, I don't think it would work quite as easily as that unfortunately and i do agree with what leslie said which is we shouldn't be just targeting older people or just younger people or just people from a certain demographic we should be targeting everybody without becoming overly obsessed with numbers because yes getting more people into the hobby is certainly important but personally speaking if I had the choice at my local club, I would rather that a dozen people rocked up who were going to stick around, participate, go on the air, be active and do stuff, rather than 100 or 200 people turn up who, after the first couple of weeks or months, we would never ever see or hear of again. So, yeah, numbers are important, but I don't think they're everything. Back to you, Martin. Yeah, OK, let's, uh, Esmond. Yeah, understood. Now, before I bring Ruth in on this one, I'm just going to put, put, put the thing. I think we've got a good uh, age range of people here tonight because I'm the oldest. I'm sure I am. And I'm one of the seniors, Edmund. Leslie's not quite as old as me, so he's not quite a senior yet. Uh, and I think that's a fair to stay. You say you're in your 40s, so you're mid, midlife uh, as such. And we have Ruth on board, who's a youngster compared with us and nothing wrong with that roof but you, you so we have the three age groups to discuss this and i think it, it's a fair conversation and one of the things ian says and if he's correct he says that the average age of the awrl member is 65 plus that's a bit worrying isn't it roof it definitely is we really want to try to it's important to market to all age groups but you also want to ensure that the everybody in the hobby will be in the hobby for longer than a couple of years 
This has been a great discussion, this one especially. I think everybody's had some really great points, and it's very fascinating for me listening to it all. Like I said, I think encouraging seniors to join Amateur Radio is really good. Ian's points make, make general sense, and I agree that ham radio is a good way to stay active and involved in both, both your mind and body. And getting um, older people to get their licenses would give them people to talk to and stuff to do. But, like others have already said here, I agree that getting people of all ages and all walks of life involved in amateur radio is very, very important. We can learn so much from each other. We've got to encourage all age groups, young people, middle age, and seniors. Um, all age groups are important to the hobby, so it's definitely our ongoing challenge to try to attract people from all age groups. Yeah, well, I think I think we've done a fa fair pricey on uh, what Ian's put forward. I think it's uh, worth putting forward and worth discussing, Ian. So thank you very much for that. Moving on. Unfortunately, this one will have actually happened by the time the podcast goes out. But I kind of left it in because I still feel it's important. Uh, Kids Day on the 4th of January, Saturday the 4th of January 2020, uh, the chairman of the IARU Region 1, a youth uh, working group, which is a lady called Lisa Landers, uh, PA2LS, um, uh, has said, uh, announced that this uh, is happening on the 4th uh, of January, and I say, kids stay on the air. Now, I've met Lisa. She works very, very hard for the youth group. Uh, a nice Dutch lady. Her English is very good. She has been interviewed on the podcast before. But it's a shame we didn't uh, get to, to, to this one earlier because we could have publicised it earlier. That's one of the problems again, monthly, uh, fortnightly, I think. But uh, Edmund, your thoughts on this one? Well, anything that's involved or that's aimed rather at encouraging young people to become interested in amateur radio is a good thing. So uh, I will certainly get on the air on 40 metres and see if I can uh, work any of these stations um i did go on 80 meters but then everybody in the houses nearby put up their christmas decorations and i had s9 plus of noise so i migrated up to the 40 meter band don't know how good 80 meters has been recently 40 meters has been all right but there hasn't been much into g on there i've mostly been hearing stations from uh from uh, Central and, and Southern Europe recently, so I don't know if I would hear stations from within the UK taking part on this, or maybe even some from the from the Netherlands, seeing as that's where Lisa's based, I believe. But uh, I'll certainly listen out, and I think that 40 metres is uh, likely to be the band of choice. Yeah, yeah, sounds great. Roof, you, your thoughts on this one? I know, unfortunately, uh, it's short notice, um, and you're away from college at the moment. Might you get a go at this one? This is such a fun event. So, yeah, I'm home, and I have radio equipment at home. Unfortunately, I'm going to be away this weekend um, on a birthday trip with my dad because my birthday's next week. Um, but I really enjoy hearing about young people on the air, and if I get home sooner than expected, then I'm going to get on the air right away and try to work from some young people. It's always fun for me personally as a licensed younger person to get on the air and work some youth. I know from experience how exciting it is to have a younger person respond to your CQ. So I really want to try to pass along some of my enthusiasm for the hobby for anybody who might get on the air during this event. So hopefully I can make a little bit of time at the end of the day and get on and hear some young people on. Well... Uh, it sounds really strange, and I wasn't stalking you, Ruth, but I stood behind you at the uh, Voice of America uh, Museum when you were operating last year at Dayton. Uh, we hadn't actually been introduced at that time, and I, and I know you're a very good operator, so uh, it, will, it will come. I'm sure you'll work a lot of people. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Leslie, your thoughts on this one? It's a nice one, isn't it? It is a good story. I th going back to the propagation issue, I think probably 80 and 40 would probably be okay at the moment. The, the frequencies above it tend to be a bit dead in the UK at the moment. But it certainly is a good story. And I can just, I can just hear the enthusiasm from Ruth. You know, it's, it is so good to hear, Ruth. It's, it's a wonder. And happy birthday. 
Yeah, happy birthday, Ruth. Uh, you didn't tell us when it was. You might want to keep it a secret, but happy <laughs> birthday from all of us. Oh, thank you. Uh, January 7th, I'll be turning 21. Oh, dear, Ruth. I'm three times your age and some. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad we're both in the hobby. <laughs> yeah, dead true, dead true. So, uh, yeah, great one on that one. And uh, as I say, unfortunately, we missed it kind of on the podcast. But look out for it another year, guys. Uh, I'm sure Lisa will arrange many more to come. Moving on. Earthing and a Radio Amateur Leaflet Updated. Now, this is an RSGB EMC 07 leaflet that's available. I was quite interested to read it. I encourage everybody to download and have a look at this. as a PDF file and it'll be on uh, our website, the link to it. But, you know, read it, but make sure you understand it before you do what you do. Would you not say that, Leslie? Absolutely, uh, Martin. My background, as you probably know, is I, I, I used to be a test engineer testing various apparatus, um, and some of the things I saw across my desk made me cringe. So I would urge people, please, please, if, you, if you're not sure about this, get a competent person in. I know the leaflet's a good guide, and no, no complaints about that, and they're absolutely right. The, the plastic pipes um they're no longer bonded to earth so you can't use those as a safety earth um, a safety earth is there to protect you you know it's there to protect life so please please if you're unsure get get somebody competent in that's my tuppence on uh, on that one martin yeah yeah well the old saying is leslie isn't it there are old electricians and there are bold electricians but there aren't very many old, bold electricians. You know, you've got to be safe. Ruth, this is kind of a, a UK thing, but um, probably very interesting for you guys in the States, although you might have slightly different uh, regulations, but the content is probably good. Oh, yeah, the content is very good. I mean, looking over this leaflet before we started recording, and it looks really great. Uh, personally, I'm still learning about the topic. I haven't done too much with earthing or anything so you can be well assured i'm going to be reading this in depth and comparing between the uk restrictions versus united states and yes if i tried anything i would definitely have someone else who knows a little bit more about it help me so i don't don't do anything stupid yeah it makes a lot of sense and in fairness uh guys the wire coloring between what we use for our wire colouring in the UK and you use in the States are different. So, you know, be please be aware, this is showing the colour of wires for the UK, which is brown for live, blue for neutral, and green and yellow for earth. So just be aware, uh, if you're looking at this in the States, uh, please be aware. We have a different colour wiring system, and many other parts of the world may also have that. Uh, Edmund, your thoughts? Yeah, there's nothing I can add, Martin, to what's already been said. Well, I'm sure you're going to read it, aren't you? Eventually. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, they used to say, what's black and hangs from a rose? And you say, a dead electrician. Oh, that's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. Delete yeah. that out. Delete that Oh, no, yeah. no, no. Leave that, leave that bit out, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway, I'd say it's interesting uh, document. Worth reading. It's going to cost you nothing because it's a PDF file. Just spend a bit of time and read it. It might save your life sometime. Or at least you'll know what to ask the electrician what you want done if you're not prepared to do it yourself. So, that's a good one. Last news story, and it's really an announcement. Um, guys, you can discuss this with me, me, uh, because I'm quite happy about this. Some time ago, we got sent a book for evaluation, and I, I have evaluated it. It was a book, uh, by Ron Bartron, Bartron, VK2 DQ. And Ron's book uh, was absolutely brilliant. It was the Radio Theory Handbook. Now, he sent us an evaluation copy. Colin has the evaluation copy. He uh, 
really liked it and uh, he's been reading it i liked it so much i went and bought a copy ron i've shown it to a number of other people and they've all bought copies everybody who's seen this book has gone out and bought a copy of it so ron has just updated it and he's added new chapters and some extra information some extra drawings and the drawings are very very good in the original book so i cannot imagine it being a bad publication i haven't seen this one but i can't imagine it being a bad publication but leslie you tend to hold a lot of books as well don't you i do i cut down so many trees here it it really pains me um if if, uh, my last place i was at the I used to have all my stuff stored in the loft and the the ceiling of the kitchen was concave because of it. And then the landlord got the hump a little bit. But um, yeah, I do like my books. I'm looking forward to this one. I've just bought another couple at the moment, which I'm I'm reading. We're going to look that a little bit later on. But if it's a good amateur radio book, I'm up for that. It's a good radio book, full stop. Amateur radio, the original copy explains lots of things. It starts from very basic. It's like from beginner to advanced. And, you know, it takes you through some interesting uh, circuits. It explains things well. And the diagrams are very good. So uh, that's what I liked about it. Edmund, did you ever get to look at this? Did I show you? No, I've not seen the original or the updated version either, so I can't really wax lyrical about this book. Um, The the gentleman who wrote it has a VK call sign, but would I be correct in thinking that uh, most, if not all, of what's written in this book is applicable worldwide rather than it being tailored, for example, to an Australian audience? It's... uh tailored as a technical book not a licensing book so it is valid in any part of the world in my opinion okay so yeah it's, it's good roof i'm sure you won't have seen this but uh as i say you got a birthday coming up <laughs> maybe somebody's going to buy this for you if you make the hints Maybe so. I mean, I love a good theory handbook. I mean, maybe that's just the engineering, physics, and mechanical engineering double major in me, but I love a good theory book, especially if it has what you're all saying with the good theory as well as good diagrams and whatnot. So, yeah, I have not read it yet, but it's on my bucket list to get and read, especially after the glowing recommendations from you all. So maybe I'll have to make some well-placed hints in the next couple of days. Yeah, well, let's uh, let's hope that you get a chance to see it. But uh, as I say, I, if it's anywhere near as good as the original, it's going to be fantastic. So uh, nice one, Ron. Thanks for updating it. And uh, as I say, just bought a couple of books, which I'll tell you about and what I've been doing. So, uh, Ron, I probably will end up with your second edition as well. Right, guys, that completes the uh, news round stories for today. And uh, very interesting bunch they were. It's, it's great Roof didn't have to rush off straight away. But we will ask you, Roof, what have you been doing since the last time we spoke to you on Amateur Radio? I've been keeping very busy the last couple of weeks. Um, so I finished finals December 21st, and I'm now on winter break until I start my co-op job the middle of January. And I'm using my time as much as possible for Amateur Radio. The last couple of days in December, I got to operate as Kilo 8 Yankee for Youngsters on the Air Month, for Yoda Month. Um, This was actually the first time there had been operations from Region 2 during Yoda Month. I was really glad that I got to be a part of the youth team putting, we got to put four U.S. call signs on the air. Um, Kilo 8 Yankee, Kilo 8 Oscar, Kilo 8 Tango, and Kilo 8 Alpha. So it was really fun getting to operate as um, Kilo 8 Yankee for a couple of days. In addition, I've gotten back on satellites and am greatly enjoying operating from the home on satellites and also planning a rove this weekend. And then I also made my very first AM QSO on Sunday. I worked uh, Kilo 4 Golf Yankee in Kentucky on AM on 80 meters, and that totally made my week. So it was really fun. I've been keeping busy in amateur radio and having a lot of fun. Yeah, sounds great to me. And uh, as you say, it looks like you've made a lot of use of the time off of, from, from college so uh, uh, and this holiday period. So that sounds really great. Edmund, what have you been up to? 
Well, for almost all of December, next to nothing, I think I worked a couple of overseas special event stations on 40 metres. But then the final weekend in December arrived and there was an absolutely enormous tropospheric opening um, over much of the UK, down into France, across into uh, Belgium and the Netherlands and down to Spain and beyond. So I'm quite a, a low level, low power, low cost, low everything set up at home. But uh, on 2 metres FM, I worked 10 DXCC entities, Simplex, uh, which was a bit of a shock when I added it all up afterwards. But people who were set up for SSB with uh, proper antennas like, you know, horizontal Yagis and things did even better. Um, I had one chap, I can't remember his call sign, but he mentioned very casually by about the Monday evening that he'd worked over 350 stations on two metres. So if you think the band's dead, don't believe it. And uh, congratulations must go to a couple of stations in Scotland who worked um, a station in Cape Verde, Delta 41 Charlie Victor, um, using FT8 on two metres, and by so doing set a record and um yeah the, the the person who did it on the 31st of december set the record and then a few hours later somebody else did it and took over distance is something crazy like 2950 miles but because it was done on ft8 there are screen grabs available that have been <laughs> circulated on the internet to prove that it happened and uh, it's one of the biggest lifts I've ever experienced in my short amateur radio career to the extent that uh, articles were even appearing on the BBC News website telling people not to retune their freeview boxes uh, because of all the, the chaos that the, the lift conditions were causing to digital terrestrial television here in the UK. So many congratulations. To the two stations one of them is ian golf mike three sierra echo kilo um he got the record distance wise for ft8 on the 31st of december 2019 and then a matter of hours later yeah a couple of hours later callum golf mike zero echo whiskey x-ray took over the newly established record but that's a mind-boggling distance to manage on two meters which makes me think that a transatlantic contact ought to be possible maybe using a mixture of sporadic e and tropospheric ducting one of these days i'm sure it'll happen it won't be me doing it but uh, many congratulations to those two gentlemen in scotland and uh, if you were on the two meter band over the weekend and uh, the run up onto new year's eve i hope you had as much fun as i did and i certainly practiced my french and my spanish martin and probably gave people <laughs> <laughs> probably gave people a, a few few good laughs at my, my inability to uh, speak certain languages. Uh, my, my, my Spanglish was uh, not as good as it once was. Right. Well, I, I didn't pick up the fact that it was the lift was on on the Sunday, but uh, I was in a works van and, and suddenly the BBC radio station I was listening to had another station come over the top uh, on the Monday when I was out and about uh, down in Su Surrey, Sussex border. And I thought, instantly knew what it was. I thought, oh, there's a, there's a lift on. And uh, when I got home, sure enough, it was. And uh, I managed to work a few stations up and down the country here on FM. Didn't try too much else, but uh, certainly into Warrington and Manchester, which are like three, 400 miles away. Or 300 miles away was certainly doable um so yeah i know what you mean it was great fun was great down fun. here on the south coast the sunday was the good day or it was for me certainly and just to give you an idea of how strong this was i worked keith golf uniform six echo foxtrot bravo somewhere in guernsey five and nine genuine five and nine signal reports both ways using ssb he is horizontally polarized with a yagi admittedly pointing in my direction probably i just got my puny little vertical collinear in the attic 
and it was genuine five and nine reports both ways. How about that? Mad. It's impressive, I'd say impressive. So, yeah. wow. Yeah. So, Leslie, what have you been up to? Uh, well, first of all, I know that gentleman, Ian White. I know him quite well. So, congratulations, Ian, if you're uh, listening. It was a huge achievement. Right. What have I been doing? Some bits and pieces for the radio club. One of the things we've done is, right, I'll, I'll just sort of rewind us. I'm, I'm sort of the treasurer of the local club. So, as, as I was born in Yorkshire, we tend to have short hands and long pockets. Anyway, we're talking about buying equipment. And I said to him, look, uh, we've, well, we had a meet and all the rest of it. And I said, look, we, we can afford to get new equipment in. So I went down with the chairman and we bought a secondhand Icom 7300, which we're chuffed to bits with. But what I've been trying to do is learn how to use it because the, the equipment we used to have was uh, 1980s style. And this is like year 2000 style. So I've been going through the books and the guides to try, to, to try and uh, try and learn it. It's, it's very, it, it's simple, but it's very complex, if that makes sense. There's an awful lot to that radio. So we've been busy, uh, busy trying to learn how to use it. The other thing I, I should really mention is a, a thank you to a guy called Paul Webb, um, M0B Bravo Mike November. He was on the uh, GQRP club site and he popped up a little note about some uh, CW tone kits. And I went, yes, please. And he sent me some in the post. And uh, Paul, those are going to be used by our uh, students. And I'm going to make sure of that. Um, thank you so much, Paul. It was very, very much appreciated. Anyway, that's everything from me, Martin. Yeah, well, it sounds like you've had, had quite a busy one as well, Leslie. So, uh, yeah, well, this time around, I've actually done a few things. I managed to uh, fit a, a TXCO into an FT817. Now, yes, you're probably going to be upset with me, but it was a Chinese one. But, uh, yeah, the difference between £70 and £7 is uh, a little bit of a difference. Bought some banana plugs and a new power lead off of eBay, so uh, that worked out well. Spent a little bit of time playing with DMR. Basically, back in the summer, I'd ended up with a DMR code plug that I was really, really happy with. And then... Adrian, uh, M0GLJ, told me that um, Brandmeisters were doing away with uh, reflectors. So what you could do previously, back then, was uh, set your radio up for a talk group, then add another talk group in as a reflector. So you effectively, you could add things dynamically as you were, were using the radio, which made the radios very, very flexible. Unfortunately, the people at Brown Mice decided that they were doing away with reflectors. So my uh, co-plug suddenly became uh, not very useful. Adrian took it off me. He did some changes. Thanks, Adrian, for what you did. And you did say I needed to check it. In the end, I ended up rewriting it myself. Um, but uh, looked at what you did, but rewrote it myself for what I wanted. So I've now got a working co-plug, which I'm quite pleased on that. Had quite a few contacts on Fusion because I'm often in the car going to work and coming back. And I had a few four meter contacts as well. Uh, yeah, it's quite fun and uh, we're doing uh, a lot there. I reinstalled my HF antenna. Uh, my off center dipole came down just before Christmas. The uh, support rope at the far end rotted through with ultraviolet and uh, it was down for most of Christmas. but. Uh, I got out there and did it a couple of days ago, so I'm back on HF if need be. Monday night's two-metre lift was phenomenal, as Edmund's just told you. Uh, absolutely brilliant. But the last thing in my book, I've got some books for Christmas. I've got the ARRL 2020 handbook and the ARRL antenna handbook. So I think I was a very lucky boy. I don't know what you guys think. I think you need to reinforce your kitchen table. Uh, yeah, go on, Ruth. <laughs> that sounds lovely. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think they're reference books, and I, uh, I quite enjoy keeping them. Um, I've got quite a few ARRL handbooks, but I don't get them every year. Sort of every few years, I buy one, and uh, 
they're, they're great as reference books. So uh, that's good. The, 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 the best books are those with coffee stones and thumb marks. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. But, but the silly thing is, the ARRL 2020 handbook is, this is a softback version with the RSGB discount is about £44, right? I bought a 2006 ARRL handbook in mint condition at the Cats Bazaar. I know it's 2006, but the, the physics don't change. Physics doesn't change for one pound so no gospel so they are so if you look around rallies you can often pick ones up that are a few years old but 80 80 percent of them never changes so you know that's a little tip for somebody you know i have to if i see a good one i pick it up and i picked up the 2006 so i was pleased with that so you you're a bit gobsmacked there leslie at the price I was because <laughs> I remember when I was studying, yeah. um, I had to have two sets of books. One, one, um, one that was thumbed through and had all marks on. But in the exam, you were allowed to take the book in, the the, the textbook in. But that had to be a totally unmarked copy. Right. It was like use it for an hour, and that was it. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So yeah, books can be quite expensive. It's it's just oh, it's just one of those things. Yeah, but well worth it. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So anyway, that's all good. Well, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining us. I'd like to thank you, Leslie M Zero CIB, uh, for joining. G Zero CIB. Oh, I was updating you, Leslie. <laughs> Never. It's been a blast, mate. <laughs> yeah, sorry, mate. You are G Zero no CIB. Worries. Yeah. At least I kept you in England, mate. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Edmund Spicer, M0MMG. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have to pass a Morse test. How about that? Cheers, uh, <laughs> Martin, and 73 to you all. Yeah, 73, Edmund, no problems at all. And uh, I never did the Morse either. Uh, that's why I'm an M1. Hi, hi. And last but not least, and it's been great having you for the whole record session, Ruth. Uh, we have Ruth Willett, KM4LAO. Great to have you, Ruth. Of course, it's been great being on. I had a great conversation today, I think, and hopefully everybody will enjoy the podcast, and I definitely enjoyed being here the entire time. Uh, so 73 to all, and have a good week. Yeah, 73. Ruth. So I say 73 to you all, and uh, we'll continue with the podcast. 73, guys. Cheerio. 73. Now it's time to have a look at the news in brief from me, Colin, m 6 boy Start for news here in Cambridgeshire, a very active part of uh, the UK for amateur radio. And uh, unfortunate news here, just for Christmas, that uh, the repeater GB7 Papa Yankee was stolen. Now, it's a Motorola SR, SLR5500 UHF um, model number, etc. will be on the ISQ podcast website along with its serial number. Um, they also lost a 4G router as well uh, in the theft. So there's some... Uh, crime reference number etc and if anyone comes across this the uh, Camesha repeat group would love for you to contact the police in Camesha and pass any information you know to see if they might be able to recover back uh, this stolen repeater. Now in Ireland uh, good news a uh, new Irish beacon on the air on the five meter band uh, this is repeater call sign Echo India 1 Kilo November Hotel. It's on 60.013 MHz, running 25 watts into a vertical folded dipole. It's currently the only 5 meter beacon operational in the world. Uh, new beacon is co excited with some existing Irish beacons uh, EI0 SIX on 50 MHz and EI4 RF on 70 MHz. Uh, the elevated site locator is IO63BE and it's located approximately 20 kilometers to the south of Dublin. So uh, certainly for amateurs in Ireland, uh, certainly a good opportunity to uh, work that band there. Operators Chris, V3, Foxtrot Uniform, Frank, VO1, Hotel Papa, and Dave, VE9, Charlie Bravo, will be active as VO2 AC during the 2020 CQWW 160-meter CW contest uh, from uh, Point Armour Lighthouse. It's the tallest lighthouse in Atlantic Canada on the southeast coast. Uh, so I say it's certainly a great opportunity to work the guys there and uh, certainly a very good uh, operating location for them to uh, take advantage of. 
Uh, they expect some pre-contest activity um, on 160 meter band to have a get their wire vertical array and beverages working. And uh, they're especially looking for JA Asia on CW and FT8. If time permits, they may also be active before the contest on 80, 60, 40 meters and on amateur radio FM satellites AO85, AO91 and AO92 from grid GO11. So certainly something interesting to look out for. Well, now we head over to our feature host episode. Is it worth building a small contest TX station? As always, guys, hope you enjoy. And now what you've all been waiting for. This episode's feature from the ICQ podcast. Those who have listened to the ICQ podcast for a while will know that we invite our listeners to submit their own recording of a topic of interest. If nothing is forthcoming, Martin always manages to put something interesting together. Well, to save Martin one feature, I've decided to submit this piece about what a simple HF station can be built from and how it can be competitive in chasing DX stations or competing in contests. I've deliberately oversimplified some of the points to make it easier for newcomers to HF. I also have not gone into any real de- detail or depth. If you feel something needs correcting or expanding, Why don't you make a simple 10 to 20 minute MP3 recording using your PC or smartphone and send it into the podcast? It would be welcomed, as we'd like to see more content from listeners, and I'm sure that my statements and opinions given in this piece will not be 100% correct, so there is material for you to comment on here. We learn from each other, and this could be the start of a flow of listener-created features that we all benefit from. Okay, off we go. When you see the videos and articles about the major contest stations and Super HF DX hunting stations, a newcomer into amateur radio on the HF bands might well say to him or herself, why bother, I can't compete. To be clear, I'm referring to someone who has gone the extra step to get a full licence and hence has no legal restrictions on what he or she can do. The point in this feature may well also apply to those with a middle licence as well, but unfortunately for those with the entry-level licence, at least in some countries, there are legal restrictions on them that stop them from operating on an equal footing on the HF bands. First of all, we should realise that the big HF stations didn't have all those great locations, multiple towers and tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of radio equipment to start with. They once were small fish, starting off in the big lake as we are. Be that as it may, let's get back to the initial question. Today, is it even worth setting up what is a compromised station and trying to compete in contests or chasing that DX station? The answer is definitely yes. Using the new digital data modes, or even Morse code, lower powered stations and those with limited antennas do stand a chance in getting through, but let's make this more difficult. Let's just talk about SSB phone stations without the signal to noise advantages of the other modes. Can these ever get through the pileups or make the points in a contest despite lower signal to noise ratio and limited antennas? Well, If this is you, you are very unlikely to ever win one of the large contests. But you can still have some fun, especially in smaller, more regional contests. You can also bag that rare DX with some luck and a few skills and tricks. So don't give up. Remember, the harder the challenge, the more fulfilling the success. Let's look at the major components of a radio station in sequence of importance. Number one is location. Location, location. As the real estate guys say, location is everything. Often this is not something that we can control. Our house is where it is, and unless we plan on moving, we have to work with what we have. That being said, if a move is on the books for some other reason, a country location away from the big city noise and obstructions brings a big advantage over a city location. Number two, space, related of course also to the location, but the more space you have, the more opportunities you have for your antenna choice. Three, antenna possibilities. Do you have any legal or physical restrictions that limit what antenna you can put up? If so, you'll have to work with what is allowed or look at setting up or renting a shared remote station. Four, towers are just masts. 
For this feature, I will assume that in our small newbie station, we can't have towers, either because of regulations or because of cost. So, we will plan to use simple masts, which can be considered temporary structures, and as such, also get around regulations in some parts of the world. Five, and now only at number five, do we even look at the transceiver equipment. While the latest and greatest is what many would recommend to you, and to be with it, of course, you need an SDR-based radio with a waterfall display. In real terms, any of the commercial 100 watt HF amateur radios produced in the last 10 years will perform well for you. You don't need the latest and greatest. If buying used, I would recommend you pay to get the transceiver serviced by a qualified engineer so that you don't inherit the previous owner's problems. You can even build your own QRP rig from a kit if you have those skills. However, when chasing that rare DX or competing in the contest, 5 watts may be a little low on the power level. So an add-on 50 watt amplifier may be a good second kit to build unless you're up for the challenge of QRP. Which in itself also brings the thrill of achievement of achieving so much with so little. Number 6. And what about power? While 100 watts will put out a good signal, especially with a resonant antenna, in a pile-up situation, an amplifier can give you an edge. But they are expensive, aren't they? Well, the well-known ones in their large cases can cost into thousands of dollars for the 1, 1.5 or 2 kilowatt models, if you are even allowed those under your license. But the difference going from, say, 100 watts to 4 or 500 watts compared to a kilowatt or even 1.5 kilowatt is not that great and there are some cheaper amplifiers at the 300 to 500 watt level from Italy and China that are far cheaper than the major amplifier companies. As long as you go for the amateur ones and not the CB ones they make good financial sense and generally work well. Number 7. Amplifier Alternatives the best amplifier is a great antenna, but another alternative when using SSB on HF to increase the punch of your signal, rather than adding an RF power amplifier, is to increase the punch at the other end, a better microphone, or an external speech processor, especially the RF clipper types, can make almost as much difference to a 100 watt SSB signal as a 500 watt amplifier for a fraction of the cost while also keeping within some middle-class license regulations. OK, so now we know the priorities for our new station, and within these, we know what we would like to do or buy, but we also know there has to be compromises. So let's look at a pretty bad case. A location in the outskirts of a city with limited space for an antenna. At least you either own the property or you have already got permission from the person you are renting from to put up antennas as long as, if you leave, they can all be taken down and leave nothing behind. So, no towers and no beams, just simple wire antennas. For masts, although there are metal ones that you could use, they also can affect wire antennas. So the telescopic fiberglass fishing poles, sometimes called squid poles or crappy poles, which have become commonplace and are not too expensive over the last few years, seem a good choice. Depending upon which antenna type you want to put up, your needs might only be for one of these. Being flexible, these fishing poles are good for use in areas of high winds as they flex rather than break. So what about an antenna? We've already said no beam. Why not a simple dipole? This is the most basic of antennas, but that doesn't make it bad. Two quarter wavelengths of wire fed in the middle with a 50 ohm coax and you have a working, receiving and transmitting antenna. In fact, what is a beam? It's a dipole with a metal rod or wire behind it to reflect some of the signal back in the direction you want to send it and multiple elements in front of the dipole to squish or concentrate the signal in the direction you want it to go or on the receive side where you want to receive signals from. What about the amplification gain of a beam antenna? There's no magical amplifier in a beam antenna that increases the signal. The signal that you have produced from your transmitter is simply directed in one particular direction and stopped from going in other directions, so that the signal you have is made the most of by it not going in all directions as it would from, for example, a vertical dipole. 
Remember also, even the very simple dipole antenna is directional, with more signal going off its sides than its ends. What about if you want to put up an antenna for more than one band? A dipole is normally for one band, right? Correct. But if instead of feeding the feed line, the coax, to the middle, you connect it to roughly a third of the way along from one end, the antenna gets additional resonant points where the antenna is usable, even without using an antenna coupling unit. The downside of this is that the connection point to the antenna no longer has the same 50 ohms impedance as the coax, rather nearer to 200 ohms. So we need to add a transformer with a ratio of 4 to 1 to match the two connections. In antenna worlds, this transformer is called a ballon. OK, so how do we physically support this dipole antenna, whether I'm feeding it in the middle on its primary resonant band, or offset, to make it work on multiple bands? There are two common approaches. You can support each end of the wire via insulating cords so that the wire is sort of horizontal and the feed wire dangles down somewhere along its length. One end of this setup might be fastened to your house or an outbuilding and the other end to one of the telescopic fishing poles I mentioned earlier. Such a pole can be supported by simply fastening it to a fence post with cable ties. Alternatively, the dipole can be put up with just the feed point raised up as high as possible, again using our fence post supported fishing pole and the dipole elements of the antenna serve double purpose as they act as guy wires for the mast. The feed coax comes down the fishing pole mast. Both of these arrangements allow you to remove the antenna easily if you leave a rental property or if you want to put up a different antenna. If the antenna is over a quarter of a wavelength above ground on the band it is being operated on, it will have some directivity. If it is below that height, it will radiate and receive almost equally in all directions. What are other simple wire antennas that may be of interest? Rather than the dipole, an end-fed half-wave wire is quite efficient and has the advantage that the end of the antenna via a 9 to 1 transformer can go to a shorter feed cable to your station. The downside though is that you must also install a counterpoise on the ground as the half wave wire needs to operate against something and if you don't put a counterpoise in it'll try to use the screen of the coax back to your radio station and you could get RF burns off your transmitter. Two similar antennas that are both effective and cheap to build are the Delta Loop and the Sky Loop. As the names suggest, these antennas are a complete loop of wire. With the Delta Loop, it is a triangle and can be sloping or vertical. The Sky Loop is horizontal. These are great antennas and can be considered almost as good as a two element beam in some directions. But they need a lot of space and hence are only worth considering if you have the space. On their native resonant frequency, they are omnidirectional, but on multiples of their frequency, they become directional in the direction away from where the feed point is. So a 40 meter sky loop antenna has a gain of about 2 to 3 dB on 20 meters, in that it concentrates the signals from the antenna more in the direction away from the feed point. If you have even more space, and want to operate on 80 or 160 meters, the beverage antenna is a great low to ground, low noise, receive only antenna. But in the main cases we are talking about, the Delta Loop, Sky Loop and beverage are probably out of the question because of the space needed. So, let's stick with the wire dipole for a while. If you want the best performance, you will build the dipole to operate on just one band, e.g. 40 meters or 20 meters where, when the lengths of the wires are trimmed to resonance, there will be very little power reflected and hence a very low SWR ratio indicated on an SWR bridge. After all, we are talking about getting the best signal out of and into the station to be able to get through to that DX or contest station. Losing signal in the coax because the antenna wasn't resonant and the antenna not radiating all the signal would be rather silly. To get better signals to and from the antenna, you can use better coax cable, which has a lower signal loss per meter. And of course, if you reduce the length of the feed line as much as possible by locating your antenna as close as possible to your radio room, it will also improve signals.
There will have to be some compromises, but reducing the feed cable length and increasing its quality will improve both the receive and transmit performance of your station. Whether any costs incurred in doing so are justified, you will have to decide yourself. You should certainly avoid using inline connectors or squashing the cable as you bring it inside. All of these actions may only create very minor differences, but not having the signal loss may be the minor difference that makes the difference between you hearing a station and not doing so. So the old saying, if you can't hear it, you can't work it, is still very true. So, let's say that you have now put up and cabled in the best antenna that you can manage to your radio shack, or perhaps it's just a corner in your office in the spare bedroom. What can we do for an operational point of view to have a better chance of landing the special D expedition station or points in a contest? Well today a computer is unavoidable. Whether it's just to monitor the DX cluster websites to see whether your sought after DX station is working or to be able to log via the computer in a contest, if you can manage to dedicate an internet connected computer to your radio station, that's great. But you can share your normal home office computer as long as it is close enough to the radio station. In fact, if you're going to connect the computer to your radio, as is often very advantageous to help operations, the computer needs to be next to the rig. OK, but before you even consider joining the fight on the HF bands, there are a set of rules that you need to know and need to follow, even when it might seem easier not to follow the rules. Break the rules and you can get blacklisted very quickly. The rules are the DX code of conduct which I will now read out. Number one, I will listen and listen and listen again before calling. Number two, I will only call if I can copy the DX station properly. Number three, I will not trust the DX cluster and will be sure of the DX station's call sign before calling. Number four, I will not interfere with the DX station nor anyone calling and will never tune up on the DX station's frequency or a frequency he is listening on. 5. I will wait for the DX station to end a contact before I call. 6. I will always send my full call sign. 7. I will call one time and then listen for a reasonable interval. I will not call continuously. 8. I will not transmit when the DX operator calls another call sign, not mine. 9. I will not transmit when the DX operator queries a call sign, not like mine. 10. I will not transmit when the DX station requests geographic areas other than mine. 11. When the DX operator calls me, I will not repeat my call sign unless I think he has copied it incorrectly. 12. I will be thankful if and when I make a contact. 13. I will respect my fellow hams and conduct myself so as to earn their respect. These rules are applicable to all radio contacts, not just when calling DX stations. You may hear stations breaking these rules and apparently getting through. They are not getting through because they break the rules, rather despite the fact. And the fact that they are probably breaking other power rules as well. Do not copy their bad habits. It won't help you in the short or the long run. So, what are the skills or tricks that might get through when you're with your compromised station? Well, the first one is patience. You will most likely never get in first, but if you persevere, you do have a chance. Always be polite, even if those around you aren't. As we always say, if you can't hear a station, you can't work it. So, you need to take some time to experiment with the receiver side of your rig to see how best to make a signal readable. The logical action would be to turn up all the gains and then listen. While this can be correct on VHF and UHF bands that have low band noise levels, it's not always right on the HF bands, especially with the new SDR rigs, but also with others. It is often better to turn the RF gain down and the AF gain up. If you have noise cancelling headphones, turn that system on and use its amplification and processing of the audio signal as well. 
what you are doing here is reducing both the band noise and the audio in it at the RF stages of the radio and then increasing the audio relative to the n now lower bass noise level. OK, the S meter is going to say the signal is less, but it should be easier to understand. Other controls are available on different rigs that you need to try out to see how they help. The AGC control for very, very weak signals may be best turned off, but be warned. When a loud signal comes on, it will be distorted as it then overloads various radio stages. If your radio has different selectable and possibly even shapeable filters, either crystal or digital, reducing the bandwidth being received can again remove some of the band noise and certainly noise from nearby stations on the band. A notch filter, if your radio has one, can not only remove or reduce an interference signal, but it can also be used to further reduce the receiver bandwidth. The key is to find what works on your transceiver. By using existing features on your rig, you will be able to hear stations weaker than you ever thought you could. Often DX stations that have pileups will operate split. What this means is that they transmit on one frequency and listen on a range of other frequencies often 5 or 10 or 15 kilohertz away. You need to understand exactly what your transceiver can do when it comes to operating split. You need to be able to switch from listening to the DX station to listening to the station he or she is working, if you can hear that station, because this is a great way to be the next station the DX station works. If you can transmit on exactly the same frequency as the station he or she just worked, even if you are 3S points weaker, the fact that you are where the DX station is listening and he doesn't have to tune to find another contact can bring you the contact. You need to be able to know exactly the point when the previous station stops talking and then come in with your call. This is the reason you have to be very comfortable with how your radio works to support split contacts Otherwise, you might end up transmitting on top of the DX station, which is a real no-no. If the DX station is not working split, but rather using just one frequency, then tail ending on the end of a previous station can also work. But the problem is that the world and his brother are trying to do the same thing, and many of those will have a far louder signal than you. For a same frequency contact, DX station or contest station, you can try another trick by coming back a few hundred hertz off frequency. To do this, you use the transmit incremental tuning option of your radio rather than the split feature as it's better with smaller frequency differences. When an operator hears a station a little off frequency, it is an, a natural reaction for him or her to want to tune you in and in so doing the distant station has tuned out the other callers and you are at the centre of concentration of the distant station. Probably the most important thing to do when trying to make a difficult contact is to wait a while and see how the operator is working. If, for example, it seems that he or she always goes back to the last station who calls, then they are probably facing a pile-up that is like a wall of noise and they wait until they can hear just one call sign. If this is what they are doing, you can try to be that last caller in the queue. But this is a dangerous approach, as you can end up transmitting when the station you want to talk to has already come back to a different station and you are causing QRM. Often this method also has stations breaking the DX rules of conduct, in that having made their call, instead of waiting to see if they got through, when they hear someone else calling, they are insulted as they believe it's their contact and they call again, which in turn upsets someone else. And at the end of the day, in the time that four stations could have got a contact, only one does. Or the DX station closes down in disgust. In an ideal, polite world, everyone would get a chance. Unfortunately, there are far too many rude hams that think the bands belong to them and they have the right to ride roughshod over all other stations. This is a sad situation, 
and I personally think that when such stations are taking part in a contest, they should be penalised or completely excluded if proof is provided to the contest organisers. Unfortunately, most contest organisers don't want to be seen as control freaks and the best normal operators can expect is perhaps a mention that some operators misbehaved in the contest summary report. As an operator of a compromised station, it is important to learn early that these people exist in our hobby as they do in every facet of life and to simply turn the dial and perhaps come back later and try again to get that contact with the DX station. It'll be so much more of a thrill when you do eventually get through. So those were my thoughts. As I said at the beginning, I'm sure not everyone will agree with them. That's fine. You can post a, a short comment on the website, but that's not the best way to respond. Please make a short recording and perhaps expand on why what I have said, either about technology or operating, is not what you believe, and we'll get your comments on air in the podcast. ICQ Podcast, from amateurs, for amateurs. For all the news, links and information, visit www.icqpodcast.com. Well, it's always great to hear from uh, people regarding some of the things we cover in the podcast. And we've got a couple of bits of feedback on the last show, episode 314, uh, entitled Low Band VHF, in relation to the bit about other podcasts and podcast promotion. So, Marlo Montanero, I think it's pronounced, um, says, love listening to the podcast. And guys, uh, comment to make on the last show regarding the AWL podcast because they don't market themselves. And he suggests that just simple searching will highlight amateur radio podcasts by the AWRL along with shows like the ICQ podcast. So plus, I'm guessing that when they started the Doctors in podcast several weeks ago, uh, several years ago, it was just a news items uh, like upcoming changes they were making was a news item this week. He's only recently got into listening to podcasts uh, on amateur radio and found uh, the shows through common searches. So, so he questions: Does it come down to just not paying attention, and is that really the fault of the AWRL? So that's Mario, Kila Alpha 2, India, Romeo, uh, Quebec. And then Mark uh, Wardell, Alpha Golf 7 Hotel Hotel, says uh, he's been thinking about, well about the segment where we were talking about uh, podcast promotion. And he asked how podcasts promote themselves and how do ICQ promote themselves. And also turn this around, um, how have uh, you learned about a podcast himself? He says um, he's used specific tools to search podcasts in his app. Uh, and maybe you should do this again a bit more often. Uh, he's learned about it because it was referenced from another podcast, uh, or he's learned for it from another source, primarily a website, and this seems to be what they're saying the ADRL should be doing more of, and yet my experience, this is the least likely way people learn about podcasts. Uh, is it just some thoughts he's had after listening to your podcast? Keep up the good work, I really enjoy your show. So I suppose I, I'm going to pick this up because this is a bit more my domain of things, uh, what Mark and Marlo are talking about here. So this is a bit inside of baseball. So in essence, what the guys were saying, and I've listened back to the segment as well to make sure we understand exactly you know, what they were saying, is that there's a couple of ways to promote the podcast. When we talk about it, it's quite passionately when people talk to us at shows, etc. And either you've got time, well, so sorry, it's time, money, or celebrity. Now, most podcasters like the ICQ podcast, we don't have money and we have varying amount of time depending on what's going on in our real world. So we do what we can to promote ourselves across the hobby and, and and work away from there sort of thing so we're using things like other forums other websites other shows other other ways to promote ourselves going to exhibitions coming out of a, in our case a very identifiable color etc and then using as much cross promotion cross market as you can without it generating any costs because as you know we're an advert free show and we survive on our donations and all those donations going to pay in our way I think what comes about when you look at uh, the national bodies like the AWRL the WIA the RSGB etc is that the question then is if a show gets shut down because of listenership numbers or, or whatever it be, how well have they marketed that to their existing base? Because unlike us, the national organizations have a massive base of people they can, they can market to and, and sort of go from there. But I think probably more than anything else to take into consideration is this. We're seeing this with the BBC and NPR and, and those type of organizations that they're looking at podcasts in the field of gap and a decline in listenership because they're seeing podcasting springing up as a new form of, of entertainment. And what they're not realizing is what's actually happening is a diversification of the way people gather their information. And podcasting is not the be-all and end-all to the way you distribute information out to people, i.e. 
we've met some really, really clever people over the last uh, sort of 11, 12 years of us doing the show where you can't explain to them what a podcast is, but they understand what a newsletter is, they understand what a magazine is, etc. And podcasting is just one tool of getting information out to your listenership. So, as I say, it's always about getting the right method of communication to the people you're trying to reach rather than saying, how do I market the show or how do I do this for the show, etc. Um, I think that's probably what more the guys were trying to stress was, is that maybe they hadn't been touched by the marketing of these shows out to them. And that's probably why they question then is then you can't turn and say, well, you know, you haven't hit your numbers or whatever you're trying to do, particularly if you're selling advertising a commercial venture, if you've not reached the, the maximum base of, of the actual listenership. And that's the thing as well. If you're trying to sell advertising, it's your responsibility to get to the listenership, not the other way around. Whereas on a donation led show, you know, you could argue it is, is that way inclined. I think that probably sums up, probably answers some of the questions there from my listeners, Marlo and Mark, and probably clarifies what the guys were saying as well. But in essence, I know we've said this before, Dad, and let's be very straight about it. In 2020, I'm not convinced I would do another ICQ podcast because of the way that the things have changed since 2008 when we launched. I, mean, I think we both agree on that, don't we? We certainly do. Uh, when we started back in 2008, the podcast was in its infancy. And in fairness, guys, the ICQ wouldn't have survived as long as it has if we were starting today. Let's be brutally honest honest about it. We've got a lot of passionate presenters that joined us. Uh, They believe in the product. And it's still very difficult. We've been doing it 12 years. Uh, I know there's a number of other podcasts that have been doing it around about the same time. But once again, people will say, who are they? Or I've never heard of them. It is about marketing, and sometimes amateurs are very blinkered in what they they believe or want to understand. So on that note, uh, with people being extremely blinkered to some of the things they see, other people are now trying to use the new media. I'm starting to notice uh, some of the dealerships are doing a lot of uh, YouTube-type videos. And yeah, we do YouTube as well. However, in the nicest possible way, and they do some very good YouTube videos, but they are trying to sell you something. Uh, We are independent. We only tell you what we believe. If we get it wrong, we'll stand by it. But in many ways, I think it is promotional. And yeah, we'd love to get more people listening to us. It is hard sometimes to... For, for a market like amateur radio to accept that podcast even exists, Colin. I couldn't uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And and the thing is, don't get wrong, for you, the consumer, uh, you now have more possibilities, availability to you than ever before. But the disadvantage is, is you've got more than you've ever had before. So because that audience has become very fragmented, and this is the problem in comparison to a commercial operation selling advertising or selling products on a podcast, they have to get a return. Otherwise, you don't justify they shut them down. And the donation-driven model, where we're hoping the fact that your generosity keeps us on the air. So that's really where it comes from from there, sort of thing from there. Okay, so I think that just about answers that on, on the feed up there from the listeners. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to obviously thank our contributors to our roundtable this episode. Uh, Leslie, Golf Zero, Charlie, India, Bravo. Edmund, Mike Zero, Mike November, Golf. Roof, Kilo, Mike Four, Lima, Alpha, Oscar. Thanks a lot for taking part there in the news roundtable. And I hope, guys, uh, anything that uh, Dave said and you'd like to comment on, feel free to go to icqpodcast.com and send us back, uh, say, some feedback on the uh, Contact Us page, and you can let us know from there, as I say, uh, you know, what you thought about what the guys were discussing in that section there. Thanks to Ed uh, DD5, Lima Papa, uh, for his uh, feature, Is It Worth Building a Small Contest uh, DX Station? Hope you got something from that as well there, guys. Dad mentioned our YouTube channel, so youtube.com forward slash ICQ podcast. Um, there's still stuff there being seen um, from some of the interviews we've done last year at some of the uh, hand fests we went to, so guys, you can check that out from there for you. And as always, check out icqpodcast.com for all the news and information over the next fortnight while we do the show. Right, then, I think that just about wraps up everything for you. Is there anything else you, you need to add, or uh, are we uh, going to the cupboard to find chocolate biscuits? I think we're uh, going to... Uh... Get ready to get the tea, the kettle on and get the chocolate biscuits out for Mrs. B when she comes home from work. However, I very much would like to uh, wish all our listeners a very, very happy new year. Let's hope your DX is long. Let's hope it's a peaceful one. And 
Uh, I hope uh, our podcast gives you as much enjoyment as we get from recording them. Because, uh, and this is a little bit selfish, we really do have fun recording them. And as I say, hopefully it gets reflected in some of the audio that you hear. So, uh, yeah, Happy New Year, Colin, to all our listeners. Yep, certainly could occur with that, guys. So, Happy New Year. Hope uh, 2020 is a fantastic year for you and the hobby. And uh, as always, guys, we'll catch up and it's all again in a fortnight's time, guys. 73 is all. 73.